Let's lift it up for Jesus one more time. He is worthy of our praise, worthy of it all. My name is Faustin Malahu. I'm one of the pastors here at Cedar Beach Church. It is my honor and my privilege to be the one to bring the word of God this morning. But I wanted to start off because this last week we were in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam, with a group of radicals, I call them, at our church. And they're all sitting right about there, all dressed in their African outfits. I just want to honor y'all. And I have a clip to show you that summarizes what God did in this amazing city. So let's take a look. Father, I come to you, not in my own name, but in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray right now for the great nation of Tanzania. I pray in the name of Jesus, secure its borders. Let Tanzania be a nation of peace. In the name of Jesus, I am pleading the blood of Jesus over every victim. I am calling down the fire of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not only come here to heal the sick and cast out demons. He came here to demonstrate his life to us. Hallelujah. You will see the empty tomb. You will see the empty cross. And you will see the resurrected Jesus. Jesus is standing in this ground tonight. Come on, give it up for Jesus, church. Man, isn't God good. Thank you for sending us out. Thank you for sowing. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being a part of us. But it's not, that's not all. Right now, our team in Guatemala, our youth team is in Guatemala. And these are the stats they were telling me that is taking place. They have seen 1,010 people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 500 of those have said yes to Jesus. Come on, we can give it up. And then two confirmed healings have taken place. So God is doing incredible things, not just here at Cedar Reach Church, but around the world. What an honor and a privilege that we get to be the ones that go out. Though you and I get to go out. You may not have gone, but we, you went in proxy. Because God enabled you to give towards us, which enabled us to go out. And so whatever you saw, the numbers you saw, we all get to rejoice in it because we took a part. And so thank you. Thank you so much for those who prayed. Thank you to our wives. Thank you to our families for letting us go. What an honor and privilege it was. This morning, it is my prayer. Yes, you can give up for that. This morning, it's my honor to bring the word of God. I want to honor Pastor Chris for a little bit. I love Pastor Chris. In fact, I brag on my pastor a lot. But this week, he took it a notch higher. You see, he was with us in Tanzania. And at the festival, when, when the pastor is preaching, demons begin to flee because there's so much light of Jesus that shines. And scripture says when light shows up, darkness doesn't know what to do but has to leave. And so what you saw, people being carried away, they are taken to a tent that's called the freedom tent. And in there is where we go and cast out this demon. And I know it's real. It's 12 o'clock service. So I'm going to be real with you. It's not pretty, but it's kingdom. And so we begin to cast out demons. And then this lady is brought into this room, and she is strong. In fact, she is so strong, it's taking 10 of us to hold her. And she's shaking and yelling at us and taunting and telling us, you don't have enough people. We are over 100 of us in here. You need to send everybody. And I'm like, Lord, help us. And here comes Pastor Chris. 
And I'm like, Pastor, could you come help us? And he turns, and immediately his eyes take contact with the demons. The demons begin to weep. Don't send this one. Take this one away. We know you. They start screaming. We know you. Send him away. And classic to who Pastor Chris is, he turns to the demon and says, of course you know who I am. And today, the gates of heaven has come to your door, and you are going to let this woman be set free. Man, I was like, go, Pastor, go. Get him. Man, I'm going to follow him as he follows Jesus. Nothing like it. So grateful to have a leader like him. To know like in the physical battle, I still want to be around him. And in the spiritual battle, definitely want to be around him. This morning, here at City Reach Church, we like to declare the word of God. So if you have your Bible, if you have a notepad, whatever it is that you use to read your Bible, could you raise it up? For those of you who are watching online, come on, stretch your hand towards the screen because all the verses of Scripture will be here. And let's declare the word of God over our lives. Come on, say together, Father God. Thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word changes me from the inside out. I am ready to receive. I am willing to obey your holy word in Jesus' name. And the church can say amen. The title of my message today is For the Kingdom. You see, before we went into Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, they told us not to go. In fact, they told us that this area has the most witch doctors in all of Tanzania. And they're so powerful that the last group of people that came into the city to preach to Jesus, they had such a hard time that the witch doctors gathered together and began to throw in curses. And most of the workers got blisters because of it. So they said, this place is abandoned. But I love the leadership of SOS. They said, for this reason why the kingdom has got to come. And I saw over 300 armies of the living God descend upon the city. And what took place was nothing short of the miracle of God. We saw blinders being opened. We saw ears open up. We saw demons fleeing all over. We saw a city turned upside down. Church, do you know what happens to a city when 20,000 people get saved in 10 days? It is turned upside down. This is what happens when the kingdom of God invades a place. And we saw God do enormous things. One particular story was so impactful for me. This girl is brought to us. It's a baby. She's deaf. She can't see. She can't speak. And I remember the mama bringing this de desperate baby and one of our team laying hands on her. And nothing physical took place. But when she got home, and this is a testimony to somebody here. When she got home, the miracle began to take place. The child began to scream for the first time. The child started scratching its ears because it was hearing sound for the first time. And when the mama brought this child into the festival, we tested the miracle. And when we used our fingers to follow our eyesight, her eyes began to move. She was able to see this is the power of the living God. When we agree to go out and be who God has called us to be. Well, as while I was in Dar es Salaam, I started getting nudged. God, why can I not see this on a daily basis? After all, for 10 days, every single day, we saw a miracle. Every single day as we pushed ourselves, as we went out, as we believed God, God showed up every single time. We were focused. We were together. We encouraged one another when we were weak. And we saw God do the immeasurably more than we can ask, think, or imagine. And it started to stir up something in me that I want to see this happen in arts in Texas. Because the last time I saw that God is omnipresent. He is not to confirm find in a geometrical place. If he did it in Dar es Salaam, he can sure do it here in Austin, Texas. And it began to stir something in inside of me. And today I hope it stirs something in inside of you too. That you too want to see God do something impossible in your lives. I'm tired of just telling my kids of all the things that God is doing around the world. I want my kids to experience God in their own home. I want my kids to see God move in impossible ways for themselves. I want them to lay hands on the sick because we saw kids lay hands on the sick and they recover. God is no respect of man. If he did it for them, he will do it for us. If we believe, he will believe. If we put ourselves in front of what God has called us to do, we will begin to see immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. This is my desire today. My assignment is to stir up faith inside of us. That we are not just content 
to see breakthrough services, see God do something in here. That we are more than propelled to go out and to see the very same things in our neighborhoods. For the kingdom of God. But to truly understand and to see this become a reality for us, we have got to understand what kingdom is. You see, the word kingdom in the Greek is pronounced basilia. It's dominion. It's sovereign. It's rule. It's a way. In fact, this word is two words put together. It's a king's domain. The king's rule. The king's way. That when Jesus would begin to talk about the kingdom, he said, I belong to a kingdom. In fact, there's a man by the name of John the Baptist who would be heard echoing and shy saying that repent for the kingdom of God is coming. And when Jesus showed up to the scene, he said it differently. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is here. Because you see where a king is, his rulership is. And wherever he walks, he brings his kingdom with him. This is a hard concept for all of us here in the West. Because we've been raised up in a democracy. We vote who has lordship over us. But in a kingdom, the king votes who gets to come into his lordship. And this makes sense because Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Because a king chooses who becomes his subject. And what an honor and a privilege that we have been invited by the living king. The one who orchestrated everything that exists right now. And he has invited us to be a part of his kingdom. This kingdom is a great kingdom. In fact, this kingdom is the greatest kingdom that will ever exist. That Daniel in Revelation 11 would declare that all the kingdom of the earth will come subject to the kingship of Jesus Christ himself. And he will reign forever and evermore. And this is the kingdom that we ought to be a part of. But well, this kingdom changes everything. And so Jesus begins to teach in Matthew 4 through Matthew 7 about the kingdom of God. In Matthew 4, he says, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness amongst the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, though suffering severe pain. The demon possessed, those uh, casting out demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and, the heal, and he healed them all. Sorry, couldn't see that. This is what Jesus was introducing us to. He was declaring that my kingdom comes with power. My kingdom comes with authority. You see, nothing like this had ever happened before. Before Jesus showed up, the kingdoms of men were fighting one against another. But Jesus shows up and now he's proclaiming and he's doing things that they have yet to see. And he's walking in such authority and this is the kingdom of God. And in chapter 5, he introduces the Beatitudes as someone on the mount. And the first part, he says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. He begins to inform us that it doesn't matter where you're at. You don't have to earn this. You just have to receive what I have given you. And blessed are you that are poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Then in chapter 5, the same chapter, in verse 10, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He brings understanding that in this kingdom, there will be persecution. There will be suffering. There will be a cost that we have to pay to walk this way. And I never saw this in full display like this week. There was a young girl, a 12-year-old Muslim girl. She was listening intently to the word of God. And when the time came for the salvation call to happen, she raised her hand up so boldly. And you have to understand there's a price to pay for a Muslim person to say yes to Jesus. Because they're about to be kicked out of their families. And she rose her hand and when they began to repeat the sinner's prayer, she began to say it out loud and so proud. Then her mom came from nowhere and began to slap her in the face and punch her and tell her, you can't have to renounce this, we are Muslim, come on, let's go. And dragging her away, broke our hearts. But later on, as we were continuing to do ministry, we see this young girl come to us because we gave our books that explained the decision that they had just made. And she asked to receive one as she put it in her pocket and walked away. Knowing very well the what was about to happen to her for accepting this Jesus. Blessed 
are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs belongs the kingdom. Then Jesus begins to teach about how we need to live one with another in the kingdom of God. He teaches about tithing. He teaches about oaths. He teaches about disagreements. Then in chapter 6, he begins to teach about prayer and fasting. Then he jumps. He gets to chapter chapter 6, verse 31. And this is where I want to land today in our teaching. In Matthew 6, 31 to 38, he says, So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need of them. You might be in here and say, my Father, I need to provide for my family. God says, don't worry about it. He said, but Father, I need to make sure that my kids get a better lifestyle. And then God would say, don't worry about it. That's how I hear it. And you might be here saying, hey, listen, I want to create a better lifestyle for myself. I want my kids to rise up in a better way than I did. And God would hear to tell you, listen, don't worry about it. Because the solution lies in the next verse. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus begins to introduce us to the way of the kingdom. And if we are going to walk in this power and this authority, which I believe is accessible to everybody in this room, then we have to seek first the kingdom. And so there's two truths I want to pull out of this verse of scripture that will help us give understanding of how we need to walk for the kingdom. The first one is that we need to seek first. Psalm 63 verse 1 says, you God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and perched land where there is no water. David is teaching us how to prioritize God. That we ought to thirst for him. We ought to hunger for him. We ought to desire him first. That God demands that we make him first in everything. And I'm here to encourage you, church, there are so many benefits to making God first. What it will it look like if you walk to a boardroom knowing everything that was about to happen, businessman? What would it happen if God would reveal to you the future prospects of things that you can invest in? What would happen if moms, you knew exactly how your kids would turn out because God can reveal it to you? Seek him first. In everything you do. Seek him first in your marriage. Seek him first in every decision you're making. The best thing I can equate this to is take inventory of your day. Ask yourself, where was God in my day? Where did I put him? Did I put him at the front or at the back of it? Did I put him before the issue began or do I put him at the end of the issue? Where did I put God in this week? Where did I put God in my marriage? Where did I put God with my kids? Our kids need to see us put God first. As we are preparing them to excel in life, they need to understand that God comes first. Because what we are teaching them is a lifestyle of of strife. If they don't know how to seek God first. Because they will try and do it in their own self. And that's why there's so much anxiety and depression. Our kids are fighting a battle that they can't win. But if we taught them how to put God first, things will begin to change. Mom, who's feeling so mundane in the kitchen, taking care of all these babies, if you just put God first, he will begin to reveal to you your purpose for taking care of those children. That they're the future prospects of God God wants to do in this city. That they're heirs of the kingdom of heaven. And so when you begin to pour into them, a delight begins to rise up in the inside of you. Put God first. And if you do so, You'll be amazed what God will begin to reveal to you. Second truth that we can gather from this verse is, wait, that's right. A quote I learned this week. It says, don't major on the minors and don't minor on the majors. Make sure you're making the right thing the right thing. Second thing, the kingdom and his righteousness. Luke 17, 20 to 21 says, One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, 
when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. You see, if you are a child of the living God, the kingdom is inside of you. And I want to challenge you for just a moment, that when you walk into any situation, you have to recognize that you're bringing the kingdom of God wherever you go. And we have been called as sons and daughters of God, that we are to bring the kingdom and take dominion. That we are not one that sits back and let the enemy do whatever it has. His time is up. When Jesus died, went to the grave, went to hell, took the keys of hell, death, and the grave, rose up, sat on the throne of righteousness, and now gives back the authority to man. He demanded from us to not take territory and our job is to take the living Jesus that's inside of us into every situation that we belong to mothers you walk into that daycare you bring order to that daycare Lord businessmen when you walk into those boardrooms bring order to those boardrooms we are here trying to master a way of life that has been orchestrated by the devil himself and yet we need to rise up as the children of the most high God and recognize that we have been called to be leaders to be dominators that we are the ones to lead and not to follow we are the ones to orchestrate creativity and not to follow other people's creativity we've been called we have the kingdom in the inside of us and God wants us to bring his rule into everything that we do he wants us to bring his rule in our marriages he wants us to bring his rule with our children he wants us to bring his rule in our city can you imagine if 20,000 people got saved this week in Austin what would that look like? That is kingdom, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus lived for, did his ministry for three years. And look at us. The potential is endless. The potential of what we can do together when we rise up and believe that, Lord, we are bringing you into everything that we do. We want your rulership in everything that we take ourselves in. All our spheres of influence need us. There's some of you in here. You need to just walk your neighborhood. Because scripture tells us wherever you walk, that God will give it to you as an inheritance. You need to claim that this belongs to Jesus. You need to walk into whatever situation and declare, God, I want to see some change happen here. Because you have the authority in your words. Let's bring kingdom in everything, ladies and gentlemen. And let's see Austin change for Jesus. The last thing is an action item. We need to make a difference. And not just any difference. Because you see, in here, we're all making a lot of differences. We're making a difference for Apple and its kingdom. We're making a difference for Instagram and its kingdom. We're making a difference for Facebook and its kingdom, Amazon and its kingdom. We're making a difference in so many different other kingdoms. And I'm not saying it is wrong. All I'm saying is God is asking us to make a difference for his kingdom first. And when we make that our priority... Something would begin to change. I can only imagine in my mind what would happen if we put God first in our lives. If we invited him to have reign over everything that we do. What would happen when we walk into our neighborhoods? What would happen if we go into our family cookouts? What would happen when we go into our businesses? What would happen if we put everything and aligned ourselves to make God first? I will tell you what happens. You will see thousands of people turning back to Jesus. You will see a city turned upside down because of the love of Christ. You will see Congress making decisions because we have men and women of influence in high positions. You will see businesses turning around because they're doing it right. You will see our school system turning around. You'll see our kids hang no longer in depression. You will see change like you have never seen before because we chose to be who God called us to be. Listen, we have an assignment. The king, our king, has given us an assignment. And this is the assignment. Go to the lost, confused people, right here in there in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You have been treated generously. So live generously. Let's go out into every hospital and lay hands and see people come to life. Let's go out of this place and be the church of the living God. Let us burn with fire and a desire to see people's lives changed. Austin, you are not here by accident. I know it seems hard sometimes, but that's where God needs us to be. Because Jesus said, 
I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. So that is, if there's darkness in your neighborhood, rejoice because you are there. What good is a light hidden underneath a basket? We are a city on a hill and we ought to shine as bright as we can to see a lost city saved for Jesus. Come on, if you believe it, let's give it up for Jesus.